Part of being a designer is to solve problems. Everything we do, everything we make, anything that is considered good design essentially solves one or many problems. When the client came up to me about these doors, they wanted to figure out a way to provide an enclosed space for their kids' play area. If you have kids, you know how hard it is to keep an eye out for them if they're just wandering about the house. Although the space would be enclosed, there needed to be a way for them to visually look into the space just to check up on the kids. Since barn doors are often associated with farmhouse style design, which in this case the client wanted to stay away from as much as possible, the door couldn't include any of that type of design language. So that meant no clear farmhouse features like herringbone patterns or shiplap. What we decided on were bypassing barn doors to enclose a space where each door had two large glass panels that allow them to see inside of the space, even from the second floor play area. We also did away with a typical header board that is often used to secure the track into the studs inside the walls. And by removing this long header board, it disassociated the walls from any horizontal lines that you would typically get from shiplap. Finally, the bottom panels match the traditional raised panels that were on all of their doors inside the home. This gave the door a little bit more of a traditional look. With that being said, let's get into the build. I got all the boards milled to the correct size for the rail and styles. There was one rail that I accidentally cut a little bit short, so I used the domino to splice in an off cut. Once it's painted, you won't notice the seams. And to ensure that there are no gaps between the blanks that would make up the raised panel, I jointed the edges that would be glued together. This creates a perfect and seamless panel that I didn't need to fill with Bondo later on. And as you can see, the gap is gone. From there, I added dominoes to join each of the blanks together. Dominoes are great because it helps align each of the blanks and also it creates a pretty strong joint. I don't have to worry about these panels ever coming apart. With the panels dried, I'll give everything a rough sanding to 120 grit, and then I'll trim the panels to the correct size. As some might notice, I don't have a router table in my shop. It's always been one of my to-do lists for the shops, which was to create a router table in line with my table saw, but I never got to it. I'll probably go and buy one someday. <laughs> so because of this, I needed to make a tall enough fence that would help support the panel as I create the angled portion of the raised panel on my table saw. Even with the router, the depth of the angle that I wanted to create for my panels was not available with any standard raised panel bit that I saw. This method does leave some burn marks, but it's easily cleaned off by a hand plane or sanding. I thought to make the fence slidable and then secure the panel onto the fence itself. But the fence would have to be pretty long to keep some kind of sense of stability and also for it to remain in contact with the table saw fence. To me, this was the best way and the most comfortable way for me to make this cut. I left some extra material on the edge of the panel so that I could come back with my dado stack and trim it down to fit into the grooves on my rail and styles. The panel itself will be free floating inside of the groove, which is typical for a raised panel door. I'll go ahead and create the grooves on my rail and style as well. For the styles, I'll stop the grooves short since the glass panels won't be installed in these grooves. I 
used a block plane to shave down the tongue just a little bit since they were a little tight and I cleaned up the burn marks as well. To connect my rails and styles, I'll use my domino. The critical piece was the rail in the middle that divided the space for both glass panels. It had to be perfectly centered so that each panel would be exactly the same size. And also, I had to make sure that the location was the same on both doors. If I didn't get this location near perfect on both doors, the rails would not be aligned when installed on the track and stacked together. Before assembling the doors, I'll fill all of the imperfection with Bondo. I like to use Bondo because it dries really hard and it doesn't shrink nearly as much as wood filler. The downside is that it dries really quick so you have to apply it onto your surface as soon as it's mixed. And you have to make sure that there's enough hardener added to the mix or else the Bondo won't cure correctly. Also, it leaves a pretty bad odor so applying it in a ventilated space is a must but it has become my favorite filler for projects that will be painted. Gluing two large doors was stressful to say the least. I made sure that each connection point was filled with glue and checked for square as I went along to ensure that the rails were indeed straight. This was a big door and I didn't want to have to take it apart because it wasn't perfect. But I didn't want to have the glue set on me as I was making my adjustments. This is where thinking through how I would clamp up this door ahead of time really helped. I had clamps that held parts together where they needed to be, and also clamps that kept the rail and styles flat just in case I was a little bit off with my domino. I made the doors taller than needed so I could flush off the top and the bottom edge with my track saw. I only took off just enough so that if I did need to take off more during the install, maybe the floor at the client's house might not be exactly flat or I might have to raise up the track a little bit. There's a little bit of room on the door to accommodate for some of these surprises that might show up during the install. Once I got the doors flushed, I went ahead and installed the pools. I went with recessed pools, which needed a small pocket to be routed out, and that was easily done with my trim router. Now that everything's together and sanded, it's time for paint. I first roll on two coats of primer, sanding in between coats, then I'll let it dry. Mm -hmm. 
I originally planned to create the grooves for the floor guide at the install location, but I figured it was easier doing it here. To create the groove for the floor guides, I used a slot bit with my trim router and did two passes to get the slot wide enough for the floor guides. For the top coat, I used an acrylic alkyd paint, which is water-based paint but it dries as hard as an oil base without the downside of yellowing that you often get with oil based paints. I sanded between coats with 300 grit sandpaper and then 600 grit before applying the final top coat, which ended up being late into the night. The following day was install day, and install actually took a lot longer than I anticipated. I installed the glass at the client's house since I didn't want to transport the door with the glass installed and have it break during transport. The glass is held in place with wood trim and a bit of silicone to keep it snug but still allow for some wood movement. The benefit of installing the glass this way is it's easier to replace later if the glass ever breaks. All that's needed is to clear the trim, remove the broken glass, replace the new panel, and then reinstall the trim. I didn't get any video of the track install, but it was fairly simple. I was lucky enough since the opening had a big beam installed behind the drywall, so I didn't have to spend time trying to find the studs. With the door in place, parents now have a secure place for the kids to play and they can still keep an eye on them from different areas in the house. If you like big projects and big builds like this, check out this media console that I built for a client. As always, if you did enjoy this video, hit the like button, share, comment, and subscribe. This is Bauer Design Craft Workshop. See ya.